let's go ahead and uh, review our unit circle, at least the first quadrant values. So draw you this here, draw the first quadrant of the unit circle. <coughs> That's the circle X squared plus Y squared is equal to one. And let's see, let's get our angles here and our ordered pairs. I want, I want the measure in degrees. I want the measure in radians. And I want the ordered pair. That point, that point, this one right here. Get that out of the way. And It's going to be a blue pen. That's a bummer. Got kind of crunched together in there. Make that bigger. Morning. Correct. Correct. Calculus, physics, engineering, most all of that's done in radian measure. Um, the way the functions are defined so that it fits the definition of some of our transcendental functions, more in terms of real numbers, which a radian measure is, as opposed to a degree measure. Okay, so let's start with the coordinate axes. If the angle is coterminal with the x axis, then of course that's zero degrees in degrees that zero degrees in radians. And on the unit circle, x squared plus y squared is equal to one. What are the coordinates of the ordered pair right here? One, one zero. Okay. Now let's go up to the positive y axis. How many degrees measure would an angle form if its terminal side was coterminal with the positive y axis? 90 degrees. And how many radians is 90 degrees? Pi halves. And what's the ordered pair right there on the unit circle? Zero one. Very good. Okay, what about the angle that splits the first quadrant into two congruent parts? That's a 45 degree angle. I'm gonna move this down a little bit so I can fit both of these in here. So this one is 45 degrees. How many radians is that? Pi over four and the ordered pair right there. Both of them are square root of two over two because that's the line Y is equal to X. Okay, then this smallest angle that we have here, 30 degrees. How many radians is that? Good, pi over six, and who knows the ordered pair there? Uh, the other way, the y value is smaller than the x, so square root of three over two, and then one half. <clears throat> square root of three is, about how big is square root of three? 
So if we were to approximate the size of square root of three over two, square root of three is not quite two. Let's say it's about 1.7. And so if we buy that, divide that by two, it's about eight point eight ish, right? So here the it's easy to remember that that one goes first because X is so much bigger than the Y. Now up here at 60 degrees, how many radians you got there? Pi over three. And the ordered pair is flipped there. There the X is the smaller value and the Y is the larger value. It's important to know those because on the unit circle, the X and the Y correspond to the cosine of the angle theta and the sine of the angle theta. And then if we know those and we can count our way around the unit circle, then we can figure out the ordered pairs elsewhere. So we're gonna use that a lot today, but if you have any web work questions that you want to start with, I'll be glad to start there. Yes, sir. I think this is the one that says express your answer to the nearest tenth and it doesn't want any decimals. Really? Yeah. I couldn't fix it. I don't know how to I don't know how to modify the web work program. I don't think I have it authority to do it so it just kicks me out whenever i try to fix mistakes but i did want to mention that we want to find the area of the sector of a circle the instructions are to the nearest 10 but blow that part off let's do it to the nearest whole number so that's an error on web work nearest whole number so if you guys can go back and fix that. So remember the area formula for the sector of a circle. We had two formulas last time that they both look like um, uh, part divided by whole. And then you either had your area or your arc length. For area, we'd have par, pi r squared here. And for arc length, we had part over whole times two pi r. In both of those cases, we can simplify the formulas. In the area formula, the pi's will cancel. So you might want to use it in the form one half theta r squared. And here the two pi cancel, so that just simplifies to r times theta. We'll be using the area formula in this problem. So all we have to do is feed those two numbers in there. So in this example, area is equal to one half, two pi over three times 59.8 squared. I think we should get 16 out of this if I remember this problem. So let me try it. Here the halves will cancel. Let me take the 59.8 and square it. Yep. 59.8 squared. Then I'm going to multiply that by pi and divide by three. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I've got the wrong problem because I'm getting 3744.8. You got that and it wouldn't take it? No. Try, throwing, try rounding it up to 3745. See if it'll take that. Didn't take that one? All right, then let's go to more decimal places. Why don't you try entering 3744.82? There we go. So let's not go to the nearest whole number. Let's go to the nearest hundredth. That's what you get to do with these things. Don't listen to what it's telling you to do. Just keep entering more decimals. 
It could be number 10. One of them wouldn't take any decimals whatsoever. Is that the one that has an answer of close to 16? Yeah. Number 10? So you get like 15.8 if you enter to the nearest 10th and, and if you enter 16, it'll take the answer. So it's number 10 where there's a decimal problem. No decimals on number 10. It'll take 16. What's the answer? Right, because you know you're doing the problem right because it's such a rinky dinky little formula and then it freaks you out when it doesn't take your answer. That's just something to test your patience. That doesn't happen all the time. It's gonna happen again when we do the law of sines and cosines at the end of the semester. It's real persnickety with its decimals. Oh, you would just leave it right here, right? Leave it right here on the test. Show me how you fill in the formula. Right. Yes, sir. I'm ready for you. In 20 minutes, if the hand is 10 inches long, you know what number this is? 14. Okay, so we're looking for a length. We're looking for a length of an arc traveled on a 10 inch circle in 20 minutes. So think about how many radians are in a whole circle. How many? How many radians is there in a whole circle? Pi. Two pi. Okay, so the circumference of that whole circle is two pi times r. So this particular clock has a circumference of two pi times 10. To figure out how far the hand has moved in 20 minutes, we just need to figure out what fraction 20 minutes is of the entire clock. 20 minutes is, well, how many minutes are in the whole clock? 60, so it's 20 divided by 60 or one third of the entire clock traveled by the minute hand. So if we have our two pi times 10 is the circumference, multiply that by one third and that's the distance that it's traveled. So I'm using this right here the 2 pi times 10 is the circumference of this clock. And we've gone the part over the whole here. I'm using 20 minutes over the 60 minutes total. So let me write down what I just said. So we've gone 20 over 60 is one third of the clock. And then the circumference is one third of that two pi r, two pi times 10. So that circumference is called the arc length, so I'm just doing a portion, so let's call that s. So 20 pi over three um, inches is how far this minute hand is moved. Look at there, I fit it in less than a line. Oh, there it went. That makes sense? Okay, so it doesn't want a certain decimal of that. Let's start entering some decimals. It doesn't want an exact number. What does it say? It doesn't? All right, did you put inches? Try that. No good? Doesn't work there either? Well, let's try that as a decimal then. 
20 pi divided by three. How about we do like 20.9 inches? 20.9 inches. That worked? I am. This communication thing, huh? Okay, so make sure you include the units. Okay, so let's do number 10. So can you read for me problem number 10? Okay, so we're going to use the area formula. So I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to use it in this form. The one half theta r squared is equal to a. So we're going to use area is equal to one half theta r squared. We have all the numbers except for r, so let's fill them in. Put the 64 over here. Theta is pi over six. And then we've got r squared here. A half of pi over six is pi over 12. So if I take this pi over 12 and divide both sides by it, that gives us r squared. And then when you divide by a fraction, you flip it over and multiply. So if I have 12 times 64 divided by pi is r squared. We want to get r out of this, so we want the square root of that. And we want the positive square root since it's a radius. So let's see what this one is. I think this one is the one that wanted to the tenths place, but don't give it to the tenths place. So let's see, 12 times 64 divided by pi. And then I'm gonna take the square root of that. And so that says that R is 15.6, but use 16. And that would be in meters. I don't know if this one wants units or not, but enter this 16 right here. 16 works. Any others? Happy, happy, happy? Okay, so we are going to now talk about the trig functions, not as functions of a central angle, but as functions of arc length on the unit circle, where that arc length is what we've been using the letter S, S is R times theta. But we're gonna consider only the unit circle where R is equal to one. So this is in section 3.3. We're going to look at the trig functions as functions of real numbers. So what we want to be able to do maybe in calculus or engineering is use our trig functions to explain physical phenomena like a vibrating string or, or pulses of uh, electricity, things like that. So we need the input values not to be angular measurements, but to be real numbers. And we can do that by thinking of the length of an arc on a unit circle. How do you spell engineering? That way?
we need to use our trig functions to help us describe the things that act like vibrating strings or pulsing pieces of electricity or or uh, heat moving along a plate. And these obey the laws of our circular functions if we define our trig functions in terms of the arc length. Okay, so we're gonna let S be the length of an arc on the unit circle. Unit circle again, R is equal to one. And since S is equal to R theta, we have that S is going to be the same as theta on the unit circle. So when I talk about an angle of measure pi over two, it corresponds to an arc of length pi over two centimeters, inches, meters, depending on what the radius, uh, what our needs are. So when I say something like, um, here's our unit circle again. X squared plus Y squared is equal to one. If I take my arc here and measure this length to the middle, I would say S here is pi over four. Of course that corresponds to the angle Theta is pi over four. But now I can say things like the cosine of pi over four, meaning the cosine of this length is square root of two over two. And the sine of that length is square root of two over two. So we're gonna define in terms of a general length of S, anywhere on the unit circle, I'm just drawing the so if this length from here to here is S and it crosses the unit circle at an ordered pair X and Y, then we're defining the X as being the cosine of that length S and the Y is the sine of that length S. Where this again is the circle, X squared plus Y squared is equal to one. Get up there, paper. So don't be baffled when you see in your, your web work, let S equal a length of an arc of blah, blah, blah. Tell me what the cosine of S is. Now it's just measuring lengths as opposed to angles, which gives us our real numbers connection. In chapter four, we're going to take those lengths off of the unit circle and lay them on the X axis. And so we can define our functions f of x is equal to the sine of x. f of x is the cosine of x, where x on this x-axis is going to correspond to that length on the unit circle. So I can find something like um, in radian measure, I can find something like the cosine of three, that's three radians. But that corresponds to finding the X coordinate on the unit circle uh, of an arc of length three. Well, where is an arc of length three? Here's the whole circle. If you were to walk around there for three radians, where would you end up? In which quadrant? One and a half. Uh, this is pi or 180. So this is 3.14. So an arc of length three is just short of that. So it's describing this arc here. Wish I had my red pen, so I'll just make it jiggly. These jiggle lines correspond to red. The X coordinate right there gives us the cosine of S. Is that going to be a positive number or a negative number? It's a negative number because back there X is negative. 
if you were to approximate this negative number, would you say it's like negative five, negative half? About how big is the cosine of three? Not that big. What's the ordered pair here at pi? Negative one, zero. So the cosines at three is gonna be some number real close to negative one, but not beyond negative one, right? Cosine is some number smaller, uh, I guess bigger than negative one. Okay. So the cosine of three is close to the cosine of pi. So it is around the value of negative one. I would approximate it to be about 9.9-ish. .9 so I'm gonna take, I got my calculator in the radian modes. And so the cosine of three is 0.9986, pretty dang close. Cosine of three is 0.9986 on a calculator. And it's gonna have to be a negative number, right? Quadrant two, X is negative, Y is positive. I would ask you, is this number positive or negative? And that's what you would, and it'll be multiple choice. Positive, negative, none of the above. <laughs> so let's look at the ranges of our trig functions. of arc length S. So if you look on this unit circle, the biggest value of the X coordinate is one and the smallest value is negative one. So no matter what the arc length is, no matter how many times I wrap around the circle, the cosine can't ever be beyond the range of negative one and one. The sine is the y coordinate and the y values do the same thing. They bounce around between negative one and one. So the sine has that same range. The sine and the cosine represent the x and y coordinates on the unit circle. So they satisfy the Pythagorean identity. that the cosine squared of S plus the sine squared of S has to be one. There are points on the unit circle. X squared plus Y squared has to be one. We typically don't put the square out here outside of parentheses. When you read the Pythagorean identity, the square is next to the trig function. And that just verifies that all of our points lie on the circle of radius one. Now the tangent of a real number S is always the Y coordinate divided by the X coordinate. So there are gonna be some places where the tangent is not defined. The tangent's not gonna be defined wherever the X coordinate is equal to zero. Where in the unit circle is X equal to zero? 90 degrees or pi halves radians. Right? So we would say that the domain of the tangent of S, 
the values of S that can be used in here is S cannot be anything uh, that is 90 degrees, 270. Um, I can't go in degrees anymore. Any odd multiple of pi halves. S can't be any odd multiple of pi over two, positive or negative odd multiples of pi over two, because that puts us at the positive or negative y axis. Well, in math, we can write that uh, in terms of a dummy variable n. Um, if n is any counting number, when you double it, you have an even number. And right next to the even numbers are the odd numbers. So when I talk about odd multiples of pi over two, then I can write this. 2n plus 1 times pi over 2. S is not equal to any odd multiple of pi over 2. And that's for any integer n. 0 plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so on. I want to talk about the range of the tangent, though. Is the tangent of a number going to be bound between one and negative one like the sine and the cosine are? No, we've seen some, there's a value of theta for which the tangent of theta is the square root of three, right? So that's pretty big. Um, tangent is y divided by x. So if I take, for instance, um, this y value, and divide it by a really small x value, then this number is going to be pretty darn big. And I can pick x values real close to zero without hitting zero. So the range of the tangent is infinite. I can get as large and as small y values as I want simply by picking my x values on the unit circle real close to zero. Like if I divide uh, by one over one million, take any whole number and divide it by one over one million and it's one million times larger. So I can make the tangent any, any size at all. all right, so that's for the tangent. Let's look at the other trig functions. Let's see, what's the other trig function that has the x in the denominator? X is the cosine, secant has a cosine in the denominator. So on the unit circle, the secant of an arc length S is R over X, but R is one. So the secant is also not defined for any odd multiple of pi over two. So S cannot be any odd multiple of pi over two, just like with the tangent. That's the domain. Then the X coordinate on the unit circle is never bigger than one. If this number down here is never bigger than one, my secant function is never going to be a fractional value, like one third. X is never bigger than one. So I'll never be able to take the secant of an angle or an arc length and get something like one third. At the very smallest, the secant is going to be either a positive one or bigger or negative one or smaller. So the range of the secant function is that the secant of S is greater than or equal to one, or the secant of S is less than or equal to negative one. You'll never get a fractional value in there uh, between one and negative one. So an easy way to say that is to say that in absolute value, the secant of S 
is a number greater than or equal to one. Now let's talk about the two trig functions that have the y in the denominator or have a sign in the denominator. Those would be the cotangent of s and the cosecant of s. The cotangent of s has as its domain, let's see, cotangent is x over y. So its domain would consist of values of y that aren't zero. Well, where are they? What number s's make y equal to zero? Well, if you look on the unit circle, the y values are zero at uh, the coordinates of where the circle intersects the x-axis. Zero degrees and 180 degrees or zero pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, any multiple of pi. So the cotangent is not defined when S is any multiple of pi. S cannot be any multiple of pi. And just like the tangent function, I can make the cotangent as big as anything you can imagine. X just has to be uh, one uh, or close to one and y would be something real close to zero and then this number gets really large. So the range of the tangent cotangent is just like the range of the tangent uh, between minus infinity and infinity. The cosecant behaves like the secant. The cosecant of any real number s is one over y. So it's not going to be defined in the same place that the cotangent isn't. The domain then is anything other than multiples of pi. But because y itself is never bigger than one, the cosecant itself can never be between one and negative one. The cosecant is going to be beyond one and negative one in size. So the range, cosecant is just like the range of the secant. The cosecant of s takes on a number beyond one. So let's look at some values, shall we? Not that down yet. Let's look at the real number S is equal to pi over six. I want to know, I want to know, um, let's just make a table here. I want to know the cosine of this number S. Let's put that up a bit. And the sine of this number S. And I want to use the symmetry of the circle. So I want to go S is equal to pi minus pi over six. S is equal to pi plus pi over six. And S is equal to two pi minus pi over six. That moves me around in each quadrant. S is equal to pi over six is in quadrant one. 
If I want the value in quadrant two, I start at pi and back up pi over six. So that's where the pi minus pi over six comes from. If I want to look at the uh, ordered pair in quadrant three associated with pi over six, then I start at pi and go pi over six further. And in quadrant four, if I am at two pi and back up pi over six, I'm in quadrant four. I want to know the cosine of the sine at each of those arc links. What is the cosine of pi over six? That one squared to three over two, it's in quadrant one. What's the sine of pi over six? One half. Now in quadrant two, pi minus pi over six corresponds to a value of five pi over six. In quadrant two, what is the cosine of five pi over six? Good, X is negative. What about the sine of five pi over six? It's gonna be positive. Y is positive in quadrant two. The next one puts us in quadrant three. Quick, quick. What's pi plus pi over six? Seven pi over six. What is the cosine of seven pi over six? Negative square to three over two. And the sine? Negative one half. And now finally in quadrant four, two pi minus pi over six. How much is that if you did the subtraction? 11 pi over six. So what is the cosine of 11 pi over six? Square root of three over two, because in quadrant four, cosine is positive. What about the sine? Negative one half, right? So again, this is in quadrant one, that's in quadrant two, that's in quadrant three, and this one's in quadrant four. Now, if I take an arc length and wrap it around several times and end up at a pi over six, then the sine and cosine have the same ordered pair. I just have to decide what, is it positive or negative? So suppose I jump around a bit and I have an arc length of measure, I don't know, 41 pi over six. In order to determine the cosine and the sine of 41 pi over six, all I need to know is what quadrant this is in. How can you figure that out? Divide 41 by six. Six goes into 41. Let's see, six times six is 36. And that leaves me five. So that means 41 pi over six is six pi. Uh oh. Well, foo. There we go. Six pi plus five pi over six. Since six pi is an even number, that's a three full laps around the circle. Two pi, four pi, six pi. So here I am on the positive X axis, and now I have to go to five pi over six. Which quadrant is that in? That's in quadrant two, that's this one. Pi minus pi over six is five pi over six. So we're in quadrant two. So that tells me I use these values, negative square to three over two and positive one half. Okay, so the same kind of game that we played with angles, we can do with arc lengths. It's all good? All right, let's see if you can do this backwards. Find all S in the interval from zero to two pi for which in problem number one, how about where the cosine of S is a positive one half. Okay. 
What do I take the cosine of to get a positive one half? Pi over, pi over three. And in what other quadrant am I looking for, for positive cosine? Quadrant four. So to get the one in quadrant four, I take two pi minus pi over three. So do the arithmetic. What is two pi minus pi over three? It is five pi over three because two pi is the same as six pi thirds. And so five pi over three is the other one. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, how about where the tangent of a number S is equal to negative one? So first let's blow off the sign. Tangent of what number is, tangent of what angle or arc length is going to be positive one? Pi over four. So that's gonna be our reference number. Now we have to put it in the appropriate quadrant. In order for tangent to be a negative one, I need to be in which two quadrants? Two and four. So we need the, our reference number, S is equal to pi over four, but now we need to be in quadrant two and in quadrant four. To get to quadrant two, S is going to be pi minus pi over four. To get to quadrant four, S is going to be two pi minus pi over four. So let's do the subtraction. What is pi minus pi over four? It is three pi over four. Because we're thinking of pi as four fourths minus one fourth. Now tell me which pi over four is in quadrant four. What is two pi minus pi over four? Okay. So there are two numbers for which the tangent is negative one. Yes. Um, I did, what do you mean, what, what quadrant? From what I told you up here, if you want to get any angle in the appropriate quadrant, in quadrant one, it's gonna be our reference angle, the one that we did at the beginning of class. To get the one in quadrant two, you start at pi and you subtract that reference angle. In quadrant three, you start at pi and add that reference angle. And in quadrant four, you're at two pi and subtract that reference angle. So if you use this pattern every single time, you'll be able to get your um, angle. Pi minus angle, pi plus angle, two pi minus angle. Okay. We okay, any other questions here? Good, all right, so tell me at which angles is, um, let's see, number three, let's go with a cosecant of S is equal to negative two. Secant of S is a negative two, where? Cosecant is the reciprocal of which trig function? So we need to know where the sine of S is negative one half. Well, I know where the sine of S is negative one half. We did that just a second ago, but I'm gonna keep it hidden from you. What is, go what is our reference angle gonna be? It is pi over six. Now we have to figure out the appropriate quadrants. In which quadrants is the sign going to be a negative number? 
three and four. So we need our solution values for S to be in quadrant three and in quadrant four. So to get the one in quadrant three, we add S to pi. To get the one in quadrant four, we subtract from two pi. So quadrant three is pi plus pi over six. Quadrant four is two pi minus pi over six. All right, pi plus pi over six is? Seven pi over six. And two pi minus pi over six. Good. Okay. All right, so I hope this looks somewhat familiar because we did the exact same things when we used theta instead of s. It's all good? Any questions? Okay. So when we talk about arc length and our trig functions, and we're talking about our trig functions as circular functions, cosine of s, sine of s are related to points on the circle x squared plus y squared is 1. So like when you're hanging around people at a party and they start talking about circular functions, now you know what they're talking about. We do that at my parties all the time. Circular functions are important for us because a lot of times we're interested in things called linear speed and angular speed or linear speed or linear velocity and angular velocity. If a point is moving along the circle, how fast it moves from here to here, or how far it travels from there to there, has something to do with the uh, linear velocity. How fast the angle changes as that point moves from there to there has something to do with the angular velocity. So that's what we're gonna look at in section 3.4. You ready to go to another section? We're rocking it today. So we're considering a point P moving around a circle. If it moves counterclockwise, then this arc length S will have a positive measure. If it moves clockwise, then that arc length S has a negative measure, just like when we measure the angle that passes through there. If the point P is moving that way, then the angle has positive measure. If the point P is moving this way, the angle and the arc length have negative measure. It's linear speed um, was going to be given by, well, just like you figure speed anytime. You, distance is rate times time, so your rate is distance over time. So you get the distance that it travels over how long it took to travel that far. The distance is that number S and the time will be some value of t. So we're gonna denote speed with a v, a kind of a cursive v, is distance over time. So you can think of that v as being velocity, 
in um, physics, velocity is a signed entity. If velocity is positive, then the object is going in the positive direction. If the velocity is negative, then it's going around the circle in the negative direction. When we talk about speed, then it's usually the absolute value of the velocity. But we know that arc length depends on the radius of the circle. The arc length is r times theta. So we can also write this velocity as r theta over t. It's distance divided by time. So as that point is moving, it has a linear velocity, but also this angle grows or changes size as that point is moving. The change in angle over time is called the angular speed. It's angular speed. is you use this lowercase Greek letter, that's a lowercase omega. It's the 24th letter of the Greek alphabet. And that's a lowercase omega. And it's the change in radians over time. So let me emphasize that when I'm using theta, theta and S are measured in radians. If omega is theta divided by time, I can also express the linear velocity in terms of omega. Velocity is equal to r times omega. I'll use that one a lot. Let's see how to use these things here. So if here, if the angular speed, get up there, paper. Of a point P is one radian per second. So we've got a point moving around a circle and it's moving at a rate of one radian per second. How long does it take it to get all the way around the circle? How many total seconds? Two pi, right? So if its speed is one radian per second, then it's gonna take a total of two pi seconds to get all the way around the speed circle. So how about if E is rotating with an angular speed, of omega equals pi over two radians per second.
then the distance traveled by P in 10 seconds is how many units? Omega is theta over T and S, V is S over T. So S is V times T. That's an angular speed. I've not. What do you think? We're on the unit circle. We're on the unit circle. So R is equal to one. Instead of using that one, we can use this one. I've given you um, the fact that we're on the unit circle. So one times pi over two gives us velocities pi over two, right? And I want to know S. So now we use pi over two is S divided by 10. All right, we want to know the distance traveled. So S is 10 times pi over two, or five pi units. Come on, come back. There it is. Do one kind of similar. You got that one? Let me write these formulas down here on the next page so I don't have to keep flipping pages back and forth. We've got that our linear speed can be written as distance over time or um, r times omega. And we have that omega is equal to theta over t, which is our angular speed. Nope, I wanted omega over t. All right, so suppose in this example, P 
is moving on a circle of radius um, 15 inches. And ray OP, where O is the origin, ray OP is rotating with an angular speed of pi over 12 radians per second. I want to talk about ray OP. All right, so my radius is 15 inches. Here's point O. There's that circle. Ooh, that's a funny looking circle. Point P is moving along that circle so that ray OP here grows right there with an angular speed of pi over 12 radians per second. I want to, in part A, find the angle generated by P in 10 seconds. Let's get that out a little bit. Some more on my page back there. Now you can see it all. Any idea how to proceed? Told you angular speed. So that's that Greek letter omega. So up there, there's a little formula with omega. Omega is theta divided by t. I've given you omega, I've given you t. You're going to put it in that equation and solve for theta. Okay? So we start with omega is theta divided by t. We're in radians per second, so my units are going to agree. This is an angular speed, so that's omega. We're going to put that in over here. We're going to put our 10 seconds in here and solve for theta. So I put pi over 12 here. Find the angle. So we're looking for theta when time is 10. So if I multiply both sides by 10, I get theta is 10 pi over 12, which simplifies 5 pi over 6. Okay. Let's find the distance traveled by this P in 10 seconds. Find the distance on that circle traveled by P in 10 seconds. So we're looking for this length right here in 10 seconds.
Well, S. On any circle, S is R times theta. We know R, and we know the angle generated in that 10 seconds movement. So we can figure out S by multiplying the radius of our circle with our five pi over six. So we know that S is R times theta. We were given R, we just found theta. So S is, where is R? 15 inches. Theta is five pi over six. I can reduce that a little bit. Both 15 and six are divisible by three. So 25 pi over two. That'll be in units of inches. Distance is an S. Part C, let's find the linear speed of P in inches per second. That. The linear speed of P in inches per second. So I need our linear speed. What is our linear speed? That's the one that's the V, the velocity. Several ways we can look at the velocity. I need to go back to the top of the page. So I'm gonna scoot that down a bit. Linear speed, look at the top. There it is, which one you wanna use. We can do either, we got S, we got T, we can use this one. We got R and we have omega. We can do that one. So you wanna do R times omega? So V is R times omega. The radius is 15 and omega is pi over 12. So I get 15 pi over 12. Both of those are divisible by three. So we get five pi over four. And that again is in inches per second. If you wanted to, we could have used V is S over T. We just found S. S was 25 pi over two. The time that it took to do that movement was what, 10 seconds? So I've got inches in the numerator, seconds in the denominator, and that gives me 25 pi over 20. And again, that reduces, both of those are divisible by five. So you could have used either way. When it told me inches per second, I decided this was the easiest inches per second, but you call what you want. You can do either formula. They're all equivalent. <laughs> we ready for a page seven? I got a page seven in me. Are you making it? Oh, oh. Let's put it more in a, in a real situation. A belt runs on a pulley of radius five inches. at 120 revolutions per minute. So here's the five inches of radius. There's our little pulley. And then there's some sort of belt running around this. 
like that. And it's pulling it between two little pulleys. In part A, I want to determine the angular speed in radians per second. So essentially what I'm asking you to do is take that 120 revolutions per minute and convert those units from revolutions per minute to radians per second. What's the relationship between a revolution and a radian? Two pi radians is one revolution. And then we all know the correspondence between minutes and seconds. So let's start with 120 revolutions per minute and convert it to radians per second, and that'll be our angular speed. So we're going to convert 120 revolutions per minute into radians per second. So let me just do it by multiplying. I have 120 revolutions per one minute. I want to get revolutions to cancel. So I know one revolution is equal to two pi radians. Agree? I put my fraction like that so that my revolution units would cancel, leaving me radians in the numerator. So now I'm at radians per minute, and I want to get it in radians per second. So I need minutes to cancel. That means I'm going to put minutes on top here and seconds on the bottom here. So we know one minute is 60 seconds. That cancels the minutes, and now we have the radians per second. So let's multiply straight across 120 times two pi times one divided by 60. So 120 times two pi divided by 60 is going to be our radians per second. So let me reduce that a bit. 60 goes into 120 twice, two times two pi gives me four pi radians per second. That's our angular speed. That's the thing we're calling omega. So we can quickly find the linear speed of that belt. In inches per second. Find the linear speed, V. If we have omega, the quickest way to find V is what? Omega times R. So V is R times omega. Uh-oh, malfunction. We just found omega, R was given to us. The radius is five inches. So the linear speed is five inches times our four pi. So we get 20, 20, give me a zero, 20 pi inches per second. That make more sense to you than just moving a point around a circle, looking at a belt moving around a pulley? That takes us through 3.4. Yay. Which is also the end of chapter three. Now put your web work up there. There's always more.
Questions, anybody at home? We're all good? Can I get one of the bad? Anybody else want a union circle? I got some lifeless up here. Okay. Show this off so nobody gets all of your questions. 